We are less than three weeks away from what is quite literally the most important and consequential election in the history of our country. And I know that they say that every four years, but we'll go over why this time it's actually different. But what we're not going to do is focus on the specific, oh, well, this gun law is going to pass or they're going to try to change this congressional procedure. Because what's more important than that is actually analyzing the trends that, if allowed to continue and propagate, will result in all of those things eventually. Predicting exactly what's going to happen with regards to policy right away, it's not really important right now because in a long enough timeline, it's all going to happen. So what's important right now is discussing things on a macro scale, understanding why Trump was elected, why they want him gone, and more broadly, like what he represents. And it's really important that we do understand these things because 98% of what you've been hearing and what you will hear until November 3rd is, if we don't vote Trump, we're going to get socialism. Trump won because America will never be a socialist country. And it's like, man, it is so much bigger than that. Please come join us in 2020. The Cold War is over. So we'll go over all of that. But I have to warn you, this is going to be very sobering. It's not going to be easy to hear, but I would advise you to not let it depress you. Don't let it make you disillusioned, but instead let it make you enlivened. Let it make you righteously indignant because without your effort, it's basically raps. So do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, commie. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Commie. We're going to jump around a bit, but it's all relevant and important to what we're talking about. So bear with me, because to understand where we're at now, we actually have to get back to World War II. We have to get back to what America and the West wanted after World War II, more specifically, the direction of American conservatism after World War II, because believe it or not, the end of World War II, which we're always led to believe was this great time in American history. Everyone was buying homes. We had the baby boomers, the baby boomers. That's all true. But unfortunately, the post-war trends that were established have led us very logically and predictably to where we are now. And that's why I laugh whenever some fat communist is like, look at all that World War II stuff on his set. John Doyle's a boomer LARPer. Yeah, or maybe I strategically cast a wide net by creating a patriotic set emblematic of a time in American history that conservative types such as myself tend to love and then people want to watch and listen when I talk about something less commonly discussed, which is where we went wrong during that time period. Trust my process, please. Every decision, a chess move. Everything here gets back to World War II. And what I mean by that is we can actually trace the things that we're dealing with now, the things that we think are absurd. We can trace them back to the strains of intellectualism that were embraced after World War II and promoted after World War II. And I'm not gonna call everybody out specifically because I don't think that we need to be infighting right now. I don't think that we should be gatekeeping conservatism right now after the election. We can focus on that once we put up some points on the board. Once I'm a little bit bigger, then we can completely just exile these people from the mainstream volume of conservative discussion. But my point is right now that you can watch certain conservative figures give speeches about how, well, the idea that there's my truth instead of the truth is just completely absurd. And then you look at the conservative figures of days past who they're promoting, and it's people like Karl Popper, Hayek, uh, John Stuart Mill, etc. These are people who literally laid the foundations that allowed for the ideas like that to spawn. And I know some of you have got red flags going up like, wait, but Hayek was against socialism. Isn't he one of us? Is the heck off commie guy against one of the men who, who led the intellectual charge against socialism? No, no, no. Trust my process. What I'm saying is that it's more nuanced than that. People like Popper and Hayek lived through both World War I and World War II. They sought death and destruction on an incomprehensible scale, a scale of which you and I know nothing. And the thought after the war, understandably, was like, okay, how do I make sure that something like this never happens again? And basically what was decided and promoted by people like Karl Popper, who wrote a book titled The Open Society and Its Enemies, which inspired the Open Society Foundation, which belongs to George Soros, just in case you still think these ideas are on our side. But the idea was basically that in order to avoid authoritarianism and in order to avoid great conflict, society must be anti-metaphysical. And metaphysics is just a fancy word for how we know things, basically. And so to be anti-metaphysical means that it's not only that you don't know things, but that you can't know things. The only things that you can know are things that you can prove empirically and that you can potentially disprove empirically as well. This was called um, falsification. And so with regards to the scientific method, that's cool. But when you get into what this means for society, it's pretty not cool because it means that the idea of the nation, the idea of culture, of morality, of religion, all of that exists to restrict the progress of the open society because the good or utility of these things cannot necessarily be proven empirically. And even if it could, whether the metric is positive or negative is still subjective. And this is why he spent a lot of time critiquing the founding thinkers of Western thought, namely 
Plato and Aristotle because he thought that if we can know the truth, then the truth is to be obeyed, which can potentially lead to authoritarianism and conflict. And so to achieve social progress, we have to restrict claims of truth to those which are falsifiable and practice modesty with all other beliefs that don't exist under that umbrella. Those would simply be my truth instead of the truth, because if we can eliminate the things that men care about the most, their nation, their God, uh, their culture, etc., then maybe we can avoid mass conflict and authoritarianism since at that point the society would be theoretically open. This is the part that Hayek agreed with, anti-metaphysics and individualism. He was really more focused on economics. Again, good work there, but still, these guys were trying to prevent World War III by waging war purportedly on collectivism in favor of the open society. But today what I'm asking you is this, is it really that black and white? This thinking has corrupted modern conservatism to where we think that either we exist as the individual or the collective. And the collective means 1984, so that's no good. The truth is there's no such thing as the individual, which is a liberal idea, by the way. That doesn't mean that you don't have individual rights. Of course you do. That doesn't mean that you can't live your life as you please. Of course you can. But from the moment that you are born, you were not defined as an individual. You are a son or a daughter and then maybe a brother or a sister, an American, later on a mentor, whatever. At no point do you ever exist as an individual. You're really not that special because you rely on other people and people rely on you. And it's that interdependence and cohesion upheld through a common culture that is the foundation of a prosperous and flourishing society. Now, that being said, there's really no such thing as the collective either. It's been tried before, but it fails every time because it defies the natural proclivities of human nature. My point is there's actually a balance between between individualism and collectivism that is necessary to live in a stable, free society. Because if you focus only on individualism, like we've been doing for the last hundred years, then there's nothing left to unify people in society. No language, no culture, no religion, no shared value framework. The only thing we have in common is that we got nothing in common, but it's okay, because we're all individuals. And then you look outside, everything's on fire, society is totally destabilized, and then the government overcorrects for that, and that's when you get your collectivism and your big government, which is basically what we're experiencing right now, because it turns out that you can't actually tell people that to care about things like nation and culture is archaic and uneducated, that to be a somewhere instead of an anywhere is, is lesser than, and we'll get into that more in a second, but uh, you can't expect a century of post-war intellectualism to conquer human nature. So that's basically the intellectual part. Now, the authoritarian part, which is basically, okay, how do we stop people from thinking they get to declare something to be true? So a bunch of sociologists got together at UC Berkeley, many of them members of the Frankfurt School, which was a group of Marxist intellectuals who fled to America during World War II, and they published a work called The Authoritarian Personality. And it sought to answer two questions. Firstly, what makes a person a potential fascist? And secondly, how can we prevent people in the United States from being socialized into that mindset? So they go through a bunch of charts and interviews and correlations. A lot of it actually depends on one of the Freudian theories of psychological development that has now been totally discredited. And the survey questions are totally biased. The work itself is just tremendously flawed from the standpoint of methodology. But what's alarming is that their conclusion was that the potential fascist is an American who was raised in a hierarchical family that supports a dichotomous conception of right versus wrong and man versus woman, which means that if you were raised in a relatively normal American family and you were taught right from wrong and that men are men and women are women, congratulations. You're a potential fascist. And we can laugh about that, but the publication ends with the author saying that there's not much that can be done about adults who manifest authoritarian personalities, and so attention must be turned to children. And social scientists must work to teach children values of egalitarianism, democracy, subjectivism, openness, etc., because that is the only way to prevent authoritarianism and great conflict. Sounds great, but here we are now, living under increasing authoritarianism and existing basically as a tinderbox of 330 million people who feel isolated, depressed, and without purpose, but we're told that we should just ignore that because we have access to cooler and cheaper products. Speaking of products, shamelesscommercialbreak.exe. Hey, it's me again. I know it might be a little confusing because I'm wearing different clothes, but it's actually still John Doyle. I, I'm actually the same person. Here's the thing. Everything's starting to open back up, which means that you're going to be taking that laptop of yours into public. Maybe the coffee shop, maybe your local library, the airport, wherever you need to go to let everybody know that you're working on something big, the big project. Am I projecting? Maybe. But the point is that when you access public Wi-Fi networks, hacker with just a baseline knowledge of computers can access all of your personal data, including banking information, emails, passwords, all of the stuff that is basically imperative that only you have access to, they can access, which is why you need to be using a service like ExpressVPN. What does ExpressVPN do? Well, they encrypt your internet connection with the highest standards currently available to such a level that it would literally take a hacker with a supercomputer billions of years to crack. I kid you not, for only a few dollars a month, you can secure your personal information with a higher level of sophistication than a certain former secretary of state of ours, <clears throat> and not only from hackers, 
but from service providers who might be looking to sell your data, from the government who might be spying on you. The last thing that you need to be on is yet another list. So go to expressvpn.com slash Doyle to get started today with the top rated VPN service in the game. They consistently have the fastest speeds of any VPN available. I use it whenever I'm in public so that people can't find out what I'm doing on my computer. It's none of their business. So if you care about your privacy, you care about your personal information, and you want to find out how you can get three months absolutely free, go to expressvpn.com slash Doyle. That is expressvpn.com slash Doyle for three months, free, very epic, great service, and they're a friend of ours. So back to the content. Thanks, John. That was so cool. You're so intelligent and handsome. But anyways, we've had our very brief history lesson as to what set the stage for Donald Trump. We've had 70 years of the post-war consensus, 70 years of the left embracing progressivism, and 70 years of the right embracing, well, don't do anything, because if you do something, that might be authoritarian or something. And it's got us to where we are now. And this really accelerated after the Cold War with the Bushes, Bill Clinton, et cetera, because basically what we've had for the last 30 years, especially, is slightly deviating, but ultimately inconsequentially different strains of neoliberalism. And what that means is that whether it's with the Bushes or Barack Obama, we've gotten three things open borders, free trade, and the forever wars. It is the centrist redemption arc. Dude, maybe both parties really are the same. Um, and George Bush Sr. really got this going because when the Cold War was over and America needed a purpose, America needed to find its raison d'etre, George Bush declared to the United Nations General Assembly, himself being a veteran of World War II and understanding that mass destruction that we discussed earlier, that the goal of the United Nations after World War II was to build a new kind of bridge, a bridge between nations, a bridge that might help carry humankind from its dark darkest hour to its brightest day. And he said that he sees a world of open borders, open trade, and most importantly, open minds. And it was the implicit goal of the United States to impose its consensus of neoliberalism on the rest of the world, open borders, open trade, and open minds. They thought that if they opened up the borders economically, and allowed other countries to get richer by trading with the United States, those countries would become more democratic. Narrator, they were wrong. They thought that they could play world police and force non-democratic countries to embrace democracy. Narrator, they were wrong. And they thought that allowing for mass immigration would vindicate the theory of the open society. Narrator, they were wrong. This has been the neoliberal post-war consensus that the globe is before the nation, that the concept of the nation is archaic, and that globalism is enlightened. They thought that they could conquer the most consistent motif of human history, and your family suffered as a result. And that's why the Trump election is more consequential, because Donald Trump represents a deviation from that neoliberal consensus that we've had for the last three decades that has hollowed out the American family, that has destabilized the country, that has paved the way for radical leftism to march right through. And the public is very angry about it. I'm very angry about it. So yeah, we're going to put a billionaire reality TV star into the executive branch. Absolutely. Four more years for President Cheeto. I don't care. Make him king. People are always like, well, but John, you know, he's not a principled conservative. I know that dummy. You think I don't know that? That's the point. Think of everything that conservatism has always been about or what the fake establishment approved conservatives have told you that it's always been about. And now be comfortable with the fact that those ideas and principles have failed, probably because they were never meant to succeed. We are going through extraordinary and unreasonable times, which quite quite frankly, dictate extraordinary and unreasonable measures. There's nothing noble about losing, ever. We're talking about our country. We're not talking about the, like a pickup game, right? We're talking about the greatest nation in the history of the world, the redemption of which being the greatest story in the history of the world. Our culture is being eroded. Our children are being corrupted and our country is being taken from us, all orchestrated by the ruling class, by the anywheres who despise you. You very likely being a somewhere because you're not enlightened. You're not cultured. You don't have a graduate degree. And when you're not like them, when you have ties to a town or to a family or to a community, you exist somewhere. But when you're in the ruling class, you have enough power to do whatever you want, to live wherever you want. You'll always be in a position to resist the consequences of your societal experiments by living in gated communities. Then you exist as an anywhere. You have no ties to anything. You are above the concept of a nation because you exist in a different circle of people. And you think that makes you better than the rest of us. That's the thing. They don't care about the American people because there's no such thing. You're just relatively privileged people, and so they lie to you and convince you that they're working on behalf of you and your interests, and then they take that power and use it to advocate on behalf of the neoliberal world order. Donald Trump, on the other hand, is a maverick. The only thing they can't control right now is the executive branch. They can't control President Trump. He cannot be bought, and his ego is so big that even if he could be bought, the value of knowing that he's the guy to spearhead the fight to take America back is infinitely larger than any offer that they could give him. And they know that. And that's why they need him gone. That's why virtually the entire media is against him. That's why the institutions in this country, ranging from academia to federal law enforcement, are against him. That's why the administrative state, the deep state, is against him. Hollywood, all of it. He is the single biggest threat to the plan of the 
these people to fundamentally transform our country and make enough money while doing it to be immune to the effects of it. And that's really what's sad about the people who are so against him. If you asked any of them in isolation, hey, do you think the media lies? Do you think the ruling class lies? Oh, absolutely, no doubt. But then with Donald Trump, well, he's just actually the worst this time. They're telling the truth. They seriously don't understand how brainwashed they are to where a man who was elected because of bipartisan issues, hey, let's close the borders, let's get out of the forever wars, let's put the American worker and family first. That man is now, by plurality, the most hated man in the world because of brainwashing meant to distract from the fact that he reflects the opinions of the public for the last several decades. These people are convinced that they're anti-establishment, yet virtually every aspect of the establishment is on their side. It is the quintessential display of cognitive dissonance. And it's actually an argument against absolute individualism, too, because that presupposes that the individual has agency, which, generally speaking, is not true at all. So that being said, before we get into you know what's going to happen if Trump loses, I'm begging you with tears in my eyes, go vote for Donald Trump on November 3rd if you are 18 or older. Go in person, if at all possible, because they're going to try to steal this election. Legitimately, there's a video plan for that. But I'll also, I'll give you this task. Think of it like homework. Uh, and I mean this seriously. Bring two or three apolitical friends or family members to vote too. You're smart enough and you care enough to convince people who aren't, you know, that interested in politics, people who don't care enough to go vote. You're capable of convincing them to vote for Trump. So do it. Bring them with you. Go out to breakfast beforehand. I mean that very seriously. I want everyone watching right now to think of two or three people right now who they could bring, who they could convince in the next couple weeks to vote for Trump. Get on that. Seriously. Don't just think, yeah, that's a good idea, but everyone else is going to do it, so I don't really have to. That's lazy, and that's why we're here in the first place. Everybody just wanted to get high and listen to Led Zeppelin 4, and now we're literally one election away from losing our country. And I'll explain why right now. But seriously, take charge, man. We need you. Just get two or three people. Make that your mission. If everybody watching does that, everyone got a couple people to vote for Trump, extra people, extra votes, over 100,000 more votes for Trump, probably, which might not seem like a lot, but it came down to less than a votes last time. So please make a point to do that by election day, because if we lose, here's what's going to happen. The first thing that will happen is a totally manufactured and artificial period of reunification. This will be propagated by the same apparatuses that spent the last five years dividing the country and demonizing Donald Trump. We will be told that we can now move on as a country. We can come together and heal and make sure that something like Donald Trump never happens again. Sound familiar? The return of the never again, paving the way for the destruction of Americanism. These apparatuses will also elevate never Trump conservatives, so-called principled conservatives, to give the illusion of bipartisanship, to give the illusion of choice, so that the public is compelled to think, oh, okay, well, no, they're fine with conservatives. It was just President Trump that was bad. Okay, I guess they really were telling the truth. This is done not only to gatekeep the national dialogue and keep the Overton window of politics in the neoliberal consensus, but also as a psyop to ascribe legitimacy to the media after five years of blatant lying and disinformation campaigns. And then simultaneously, you'll see articles being published in conservative publications some of which are probably a fan, declaring Trumpism to be dead. And they'll echo the sentiment of the media. They're going to seek to return to true conservative principles like low taxes, small government, and the Second Amendment. For the time being, the left will allow it. But in the meantime, Trumpism will be silently purged from social and mainstream media. Uh, the momentum of the war against Trump will be concentrated on his supporters, specifically his outspoken supporters with large platforms and influence. People who are affiliated with larger uh, companies or organizations will be forced to quietly follow suit or be fired will be told that his trade policy was simultaneously disastrous and ineffective, that it was undiplomatic, that it was isolationist, uh, it was outdated, it hurt the GDP. We'll be told basically the same thing with his foreign policy, that he's the reason those regions were destabilized, that we have to maintain a presence in the forever wars, that our post-war imperative is to engage in wars for liberalism, to enforce democracy at the barrel of a gun. How does that make sense? Doesn't have to. And with immigration, we will be told that it was a racist overreaction to a non-problem, that it hurt the economy and the GDP, that in order to heal as a nation, we will have to overcorrect and put an even stronger emphasis on diversity being our greatest strength, and that we can look forward together as a country, whatever that means at this point, and be excited at our future of wars for liberalism and open borders with immigration and trade, both of which displace American jobs and workers. And if you speak out against this future, you will be censored, you will be fired, and about 10 years from now, you will be charged with hate speech. And as of right now, the public disagrees with all of this. They agree with Trump, and they have consistently for decades. But the ruling class says, no, 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 don't believe your eyes, don't trust your instincts, listen to us, the experts who live in gated communities. We need the forever wars. We need one billion Americans. Why? 
Ah, to compete with China, who's actually only beating us literally because of the post-war neoliberal consensus. And we need to we need to drain wealth from our country into China. Why? Uh, to compete with them. Who's with me? USA, USA. And that's just it. Trump didn't win because of socialism. Trump won because of trade, immigration, and foreign policy. And if we are to have a future, we have to focus on those issues the most, get into power, and then fight fire with fire and crush these people into the ground. Because you cannot convince nor argue with that which seeks to destroy. These people are not seeking to create. So your option is only to destroy them first. What we're fighting against doesn't care about you or your family or your country. They're actively trying to destroy all of them. And they love nothing more than to hear you say, well, I won't fight back because I'm actually better than that. Because they probably paid someone to put that idea in your head in the first place. You can't reason with fire. You can contain it for a period, but ultimately you will have to extinguish it or it will destroy everything. That's where we're at. And it's only going to get worse. The economy will continue to be fake and rigged. Remember the wealth transfer during the pandemic? right under our nose. Remember when literally hundreds of thousands of businesses were forced to close by the government, the majority of which will never reopen. They're out of business. Countless livelihoods destroyed. But the people at the top who buy and pay for the people to make those decisions made more than half a trillion dollars. That is probably the greatest offense against the American people that we will ever see in our lifetimes. And it really all comes down to money. And unfortunately, no one ever got rich shilling for the interests of the American people. What a grave sin. It is with these politicians, these pundits, to selfishly monetize the hope of the public, to make millions promising to advocate for and represent them, only to do nothing but occupy space and pad their own pockets. Yeah, have fun while you can. You're going to get yeeted into a lake of hellfire, my guy. It really is a great strategy. Like, you tell the left, everything is the fault of business. So then they're elected. They collaborate with big business to regulate small business into the ground. And then you tell the right that businesses are actually the good guys against the bad guy, which is government. And then you get donations to conservative groups from big business so that everyone is too busy screaming ah, well, socialism sucks to realize that they're actually being screwed over. So that's basically the trend with the economy. And that ties into everything else that's going to happen. And so we'll come back to that. But with immigration, Biden has already promised amnesty for illegal aliens. We've been told for years that there's only 11 million, but a Yale study suggests that it's actually 22 million. It's probably even higher. And with 20 million new Americans now eligible to bring over family members because of chain migration, that really ends up looking like 40 or 50 million new Americans. That's all in the first term. So what happens then? Texas goes blue. Florida goes blue. Nevada, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, those are cemented as blue, along with Virginia, Georgia, probably North Carolina too, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Best case scenario, those are all now blue forever, which means best case scenario electorally, Republicans pick up 157 electoral votes in a presidential election, not even taking into account how the distribution of votes would change uh, with the new Americans, plus the fact that they'd be in charge of the 2020 census. So Republicans will never win the presidency again. We'll probably never have control of the House or Senate again. And even if we did, they just veto anything that we pass because they don't have to play ball with us anymore. They've already won. So as a result, the Republican Party would either just die or morph into a much more progressive version of itself, uh, which would allow the current Democrat Party to continue to shift the paradigm of American politics to them being democratic socialists, and then us being left with a much more liberal version of the GOP, probably something akin to the 2008 or 2012 Democrat Party, and there's nothing you can do about it. You didn't vote for this, not in 1965 with Hart Seller, not in 1992 with Bush Sr. In fact, the public has consistently wanted less immigration, but who cares? Never in the history of the world has there been such a large migration of people as the one that we've experienced from Latin America to the United States since 1965? We're talking 60 million people. How do you assimilate 60 million people? You don't, and you can't. It's actually, it's offensive that you even ask that. And they're doing this because it's their end game. That's how they win. And so at that point, there's no such thing as America anymore. The only thing that would suggest otherwise is that we still have the national parks and the flag looks relatively the same, but who knows how long that's gonna last. For all intents and purposes, America is gone at that point. The culture's gone, the language is gone, the history and the heritage are gone, the economy's dead, bought and sold by a transnational ruling class, and all we're left to do is buy products. And at that point, you're gonna get everything. You're gonna get hate speech laws, your guns are gonna get taken from you, and if you think that you're gonna fight back, okay, they'll kill you, they don't care. That's what they wanted to do anyways. It's no skin off their back. And don't think that you can just hide off somewhere in the woods and try to keep to yourself. People have tried that before. I wouldn't know anything about that, but think early 1990s. And that was even before mass surveillance. You're also gonna have to pay reparations as a part of this period of healing and celebration of diversity. And this isn't all happening overnight, by the way, but you will see all of this in your lifetime if the trends continue. And with the increased collusion between big business, big tech, and the government will come even more surveillance. Think social credit scores in China. Oh, you have the wrong opinions? Cool. Now you can't open up a bank account. Now you can't travel. You can't rent a car anymore. Oh, and you can forget about protecting your kids from this. You think you'll be able to afford that? 
The economy is going to get really bad for people like us. Not even taking into account the war that they're going to wage on us for being conservative, it'll be impossible. In fact, if we follow the trends, what will probably happen is they will find out that you're raising your children to have an authoritarian personality, which will be defined as child abuse, and your children will be taken from you. Don't agree with the gender identity of your child? Oh, you're an unfit parent, so the state will step in. Religious freedom's gone. You forget about that. That was just an excuse for bigotry. These people don't believe in God. They believe that they are God, and they believe that they can structure society however they please. Private schools, abolished. Your kids will go to government schools, where they will be taught the 1619 curriculum. They will be taught to hate their country even more so. And at some point, it will be decided that children are a threat to the climate. So we'll have some form of child policy instituted like they have in China. Polygamy and polyamory, those are going to be next on the normalization queue. But it was cute that you thought that it was going to stop at gay and transgender people. Children will be increasingly sexualized. Pornography will become more widespread along with drugs, particularly marijuana. Anything to make the population as numb, pacified, and depressed as possible so that you can wake up every day, go to work, pay your taxes, buy your products without questioning anything. Oh, and trade policy will make that even worse for you. They'll continue to enact policies that allow the rich and themselves to benefit at the expense of middle class Americans, and you will be told by them, along with mainstream conservatism, that being able to theoretically buy products at marginally lower costs is worth being raped of the dignity of the American dream. Same thing with war. It'll continue. The endless wars, the forever wars, the wars for liberalism. And a lot of this stuff, like I said, is not going to happen immediately, but you can definitely expect at least one new military conflict within the first term of the Biden administration. And even ignoring how it helps the economy, how they benefit financially with the military industrial complex, it also serves as a great distraction. Hey, American people, we have to stick together. Those are the bad guys. The biggest threat to your freedom is coming from those guys on the other side of literally the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, they hate us because we're free. Not because we helped destroy their countries at an earlier stage of the forever war. Nope, it's because we're free. Fact check, we're not free. But they have to tell you that so you focus on them. You focus on people that are literally thousands of miles away, have nothing to do with why you're not free. And maybe they benefit because all the people who sign up to fight in these forever wars, who love their country, these patriots, then they die in the sand because you lied to them about what they were really fighting for. Now we have less brave patriots around to actually defend our country. Just a funny hypothetical. I would never seriously suggest that. And all of this will be legitimized with talks of democracy, elections, everybody's voice counts, when really no one's voice counts. Democracy is just a psyop to legitimize neoliberalism and its consequences and all that's to come. We will be a one-party state and our elections will basically become a game of hot potato for the ruling class to take a turn in the spotlight, have their name in the history books, get a statue or two. The administrative state will grow. They will never be up for re-election. That's who run things. Trump has tried to get control of them, but you know, they're pushing back hard. That's why I laugh when people are like, they're nominating Joe, so Kamala can puppet. Not even, not even. They know that they already have the power of the administrative state in every relevant institution. But I have it on good authority uh, that the second Trump administration is going to be a lot better, a lot more competent, and that some serious changes will start to be made. But in the meantime, we can't let them demoralize us. This was never going to be fixed in four years or even eight years. The task at hand is literally the greatest task in the history of our country, maybe even the world. But the point is that Donald Trump is just the beginning. He buys us time. He gives us hope and he makes a dent or two, right? But this is literally something that we will spend our entire lives fighting and our children and grandchildren will thank us for that endlessly. But in the meantime, the popular culture will continue to promote degeneracy. It will continue to promote vice so that everyone is preoccupied thinking about how they can afford this brand or have this casual hookup to fill the void with some oxytocin and dopamine instead of things like, hey, when's the last time I went out and did something fun with my neighbor? Things that actually matter? Swept under the rug. In the face of mass media and mass consumerism, you will never escape the promotion of vice. You will never escape the mass marketing because their plan is contingent upon you being demoralized. Consumerism is a psyop. Pornography is a psyop. Every time you watch porn, you move the needle towards defeat. I'm not even remotely joking about that. We need you to be as sharp and competent as possible. And that requires both mental and physical fitness. Imagine what we could do with 100,000 handsome, high IQ, high energy, physically fit young men. We could win is what we could do. And I like winning. I'd like to be tired of winning, but it's up to us. We can ride the decline. We can accept defeat. Just ride this degenerate wave of wealth and prosperity until it comes crashing to a halt and there's nothing we can do about it. Or we can better ourselves. We can discipline ourselves. We can push back. We have no choice because no coalition of people who lack discipline, who practice unhealthy lifestyles, who are nihilists, no coalition of people like that have ever been successful at anything ever. And luckily for us, the type of people we're going up against, that's them. They have a tremendous head start though, but we're still here. We're not going anywhere, but the window's closing. It's closing quickly. So you have to decide, you have to make the choice. Are you gonna watch it close? Are you gonna jam your hand in there, man? It'll suck, you'll have to make sacrifices. It'll cost you money, friends, opportunities, who even knows? But the more of us that do it, the easier it'll be on all of us. We have to stick together. It's the only way that you know, we can make America great again.
Don't waste your time on me, you're already the voice inside my head. I miss you, I miss- Don't waste your time on me, you're already the voice inside my head. I miss you, I miss you. This is how we warm up. This is the outro, but before- You gotta warm up the voice, because we're about to talk. But you're watching this after, okay. Hey guys, if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on notifications, please. Well, all of these are should be prefaced with a please. Um, I, I feel as though my politeness should just be kind of presumed, but please turn on notifications, please turn on notifications. Raspy voice mode, many words mode. <coughs> and then also share the video with a friend, that'd be epic. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna do it. We're gonna make America great again. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be old. I'm gonna be old by the time it happens, but it'll happen. Wait a minute. <sighs> Gamer moment. That was weak. That was weak. <sighs> we're gonna do it, boys. It's gonna take a while, but we'll do it. I'm gonna be 70 years old. Welcome to Heck Off Comic. I'm and uh, I'm President Baron Trump. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen, but. Uh, we're going to make America great again. I know that much. I know that. I know that to be true. I had to make this video because people, people, it's, it's like Dr. Strange, Professor Weird. Yeah, it's like Professor Weird. I don't want to say Dr. Strange. I don't want Disney to get mad at me. So I'll say it's like when Professor Weird is like, this was the only way. That's me right now. I already know what's going to happen, but I had to make this video to placate the masses, to, to, to raise the morale. Or may not really raise the morale, just kind of light a fire. Light a fire under a, just light a little fire, you know, let you know, hey, don't get lazy, don't get complicit. You know, we got some stuff to do. I should make two and a half minute outros the new norm. I've been on a roll with that. They've been pretty funny, or so I've been told. But anyways, thank you so much for watching. May God bless America. 